Hello and welcome to week one, part three of EGM 703, Thermal Properties of Objects. In this lesson, we'll learn more about how objects interact with electromagnetic radiation and energy in the form of heat. We'll start off by reviewing how energy interacts with the Earth's surface. From the first law of thermodynamics, we know that energy is neither created nor destroyed. It is conserved. Another way to say this is that all of the energy, or radiation, that falls on a surface is either reflected, absorbed, transmitted, and so on. For the Earth's surface, a simplified version of that balance looks something like this. So long as that we're ne we are neglecting factors like precipitation. The first part of this equation is the incoming shortwave radiation, denoted QSW with a down arrow. By short wave, we typically mean radiation with a wavelength under about 3,000 nanometers or so, which is to say shorter than the thermal infrared. By incoming, we mean that this is radiation that is incident on or directed towards the surface. For the Earth, the main source of this radiation is, of course, the sun. Some part of that incoming short wave radiation is reflected by the surface, which gives us the shortwave outgoing radiation, which is QSW with an up arrow. Next, we also have the long wave incoming radiation. This is thermal radiation that is for the most part emitted by the atmosphere and especially by clouds. We have the long wave outgoing radiation, which is the thermal radiation that is emitted by the Earth's surface. Next up, we have something called the sensible heat flux. This is the loss of energy by the surface by heat transfer to the atmosphere. When we have a positive sen sensible heat flux, it means that heat is being directed away from the surface to the atmosphere. We also have the latent heat flux, which is the energy that is lost or gained by the surface due to changes in phase, such as evaporation, sublimation, melt, or freezing. And then finally, we have the ground heat flux, which is the energy that is conducted away from the surface through the ground. We can simplify this expression a bit further. For example, we can define the net radiation as the difference between the incoming and outgoing radiation. For the long wave radiation, that expression looks like this, just the incoming long wave minus the outgoing long wave. And for the short wave radiation, it looks like this. But if we remember that the Earth's surface doesn't typically emit at shorter wavelengths, we can simplify this further using the short wave albedo, denoted as the A here, which is just the fraction of the incoming short wave radiation reflected by the surface. Then the net radiation, which is the sum of the net short wave and net long wave radiation, is given by this expression here. In terms of the incoming shortwave radiation and the net longwave radiation. If we put all of this together with the equation from the previous slide, we have that the net radiation is equal to the sum of the sensible heat flux, the latent heat flux, and the ground heat flux, respectively. What this tells us is that the net radiation warms up if the net radiation is positive or cools if the, warm, if the net radiation is negative, the ground layer, in the form of the ground heat flux. It also warms up or cools the air in the form of the sensible heat flux, and it can cause phase changes in the form of the latent heat flux, for example, through melting snow and ice, evaporating water, or condensing water vapor. How much it does this depends on the atmospheric conditions for the sensible heat flux, as well as the surface properties like the albedo, the absorptance of the surface material, the emissivity of the surface material, or the temperature of the surface, as well as the different material properties. So the figure here on the right, which is from the fourth annual report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, shows the average Earth's, shows the average Earth's energy balance. The different numbers here are given in watts per square meter, and this should give you a rough idea of how much each of these different processes contributes to the overall surface energy balance or budget. Hopefully, 
you recall that heat is a form of energy that is measured in joules. Heat is transferred by a number of different processes. For, to start with, we have advection, which is the transport of heat due to motion of some fluid or substance. In the figure here, it would be represented by us physically moving the pan of water away from the fire. We also have convection, where heat is transferred in a fluid as a result of flow in the fluid, illustrated here as the heated water rising to the surface, cooling at the surface, and then sinking again, then heating up, rising to the top again, and so on. Radiation, of course, is the transfer of energy via the release of electromagnetic waves or particles, illustrated here by the energy released or radiated by the wood fire. Finally, we also have conduction or diffuse heat transfer. Here, the heat is transferred within an object or a material or between two different objects or surfaces that are in contact. For example, the hand holding the hot pan right here. The properties of the material or the surface that we're looking at determine how each of these different processes occur. For example, we don't normally get convection in solids, but it's an extremely common process in gases and liquids. The first material property that we'll cover is heat capacity, which is normally denoted as a capital C. This is defined as the ratio of the change in heat energy to the change in temperature of the material. In other words, it tells us how much energy we have to transfer to a material in order to raise its temperature. We define the specific heat capacity in terms of the per unit mass, as more massive objects typically require more energy to raise their temperature. The units of specific heat capacity are joules per kilogram per kelvin. Again, the change in energy divided by the mass divided by the change in temperature. The specific heat capacity of a given material depends on the molecular structure of that material. As a general rule, liquids have a higher heat capacity than gases. For example, higher specific heat capacity means that we need more energy to heat or increase the temperature of a material. So some different examples here, we have pure water, which has a specific heat capacity of 4,184 joules per kilogram per Kelvin, which is also one calorie per gram per degree Celsius. Air, on the other hand, has a specific heat capacity that is around four times lower than that, only about 1,003.5 joules per kilogram per Kelvin, which is to say it takes about four times as much energy to heat up a heat water as it does to heat a comparable amount of air. Copper has an even lower specific heat capacity at only 385 joules per kilogram per kelvin, meaning that it both heats up and cools down very quickly. The next material property that we will cover is the thermal conductivity, usually denoted with a lowercase k. The thermal conductivity measures the rate at which a material conducts. For example, the conductor shown here, Gustavo Dudamel, has a very high conductivity. He's conducting very quickly. Another way to think about thermal conductivity is that this is the energy transferred through an object per unit time, so how long it takes, per unit distance, which is how long the energy has to, has to go to be transferred, per unit of temperature. In other words, the units of conductivity are watts, or joules per second, per meter per kelvin. Some common examples of thermal conductivity are shown here. From this, we can see that air is a very poor thermal conductor. It conducts very, very slowly. Water is a much more efficient conductor, though not nearly so good as concrete or copper. Again, this is probably one of the reasons why copper is a very popular element for making pots and pans for cooking. Next up, we will discuss thermal inertia, which is normally denoted as a capital P. Like the name might suggest, thermal inertia is the tendency of a material to resist changes in temperature. It's a way of describing how quickly or slowly different materials react to changes in energy.
Thermal inertia is calculated as the square root of the thermal conductivity times the heat capacity times the density of the material. It has units of joules per square meter per kelvin per seconds to the one-half power, which is why I've written this down here. Another way to think about this is that the thermal inertia tells us how well a surface or material retains heat during the day and how well it radiates heat away at night, or what the, heat of, what the rate of heat transfer is at the contact between two different materials, for example, the Earth's surface and the atmosphere. Unfortunately, calculating thermal inertia directly is difficult. We need to know the thermal conductivity, we need to know the specific heat capacity, and we need to know the density of each of the materials that we're trying to observe. For remote sensing studies, this is even more difficult, which is why we have something called the apparent thermal inertia. This is measured as 1 minus the albedo of the, uh, of the surface divided by the difference in temperature measured during the day and during the night. These are all things that we can estimate using remote sensing, and the apparent thermal inertia provides similar information about a surface or material as the actual thermal inertia does. So hopefully it's clear to you that Q net, or the net radiation, because it is so heavily tied to solar radiation, follows a diurnal or day-night cycle. In the graph here, we can see that at night, so between about uh, well, in this example, between about 7 p.m. and about 6 a.m., or 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., it's not that important, uh, we can see that the incoming and outgoing shortwave radiation dropped to zero. This is because this is the hours between sunset and sunrise. We can also see that the incoming and outgoing longwave radiation also follows a diurnal cycle albeit slightly shifted. And this is because the surface temperature also follows a diurnal cycle. As the surface is heated up during the day by the sun, it warms up, then it cools down through the, throughout the rest of the afternoon and into the night. Different materials, given their different thermal properties, will have a very different diurnal cycle. Because water typically requires more energy to increase its temperature, it heats up much more slowly, doesn't get as warm during the day, and cools down less at night compared to something like dry soil. Because of these differences, we typically want to plan thermal remote sensing acquisitions between midnight and dawn, when surface temperatures are relatively stable, or during the middle of the day, which is when we see the greatest temperature contrast between different materials. We want to try to avoid acquisitions during the time of day when we see these two lines crossing each other because it's more, it's more difficult to distinguish between different materials at these crossover times. So in this lesson, we have learned that the sun supplies a lot of energy to the Earth's surface. As we increase the energy or the net energy to a surface, we also increase its temperature. Exactly how much we increase its temperature depends on the different properties that we've discussed in this lesson. Because the sun has a diurnal or day-night cycle, there are better times of day for thermal remote sensing than others. We typically want to select times of day when we will see temperature contrast between different materials, otherwise we have a hard time differentiating differentiating between these materials. Once again, you can read further about most of the concepts we've covered in this lesson in the textbooks, chapter 4.9 and 4.10 of Lewis and Kiefer and Chipman, and chapter 2 and 9.6 of Campbell and Wynne. I've also included a link to this 1996 paper by Krocknell and Shua, which reviews how to estimate thermal inertia from remote sensing observations. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!